Now we're looking at the Native American groups of the Great Plains, and really we're looking at after the European colonization. So we've seen the introduction of the horse and a move west, which led to a short flourishing of the Plains Indians. They tend to be nomadic, so the art tends to be wearable or very small. And this is key because if you're a nomadic group, every time you move, you need to take everything you own with you. So you're not going to take things that are not functional. And if something is purely aesthetic, it's going to be very, very small because every ounce that you carry, of course, makes it more difficult to transit those long miles. Now, until the 1830s, they used an indigenous style where we tend to see flat geometric forms, very stiff forms, uh, planes of color, no real sense of mass and volume. And again, this is a stylistic choice. After the 1830s, they will adopt more of the European modeling, three-dimensionality in their forms. And the piece we're actually looking at, or the idea we're looking at, is the Hidatsa regalia, which is clothing, which is often find in, found in illustrations as much as it was found in real life. This is very formal wear, but it comes from a very functional place. What we're looking at is this watercolor from 1833. Here we see the personal decoration of two ravens, who is a warrior. He is holding a number of items that give us a sense of who he is. So he has a pipe, uh, he has the robe that he's wearing, a bear claw necklace, and feather decoration. Each of these would have been a status symbol, something that represents a personal accomplishment or affiliation that he had. We do the same thing in many groups. You might wear a ring. We might have uh, specific colors that people wear. You might have uh, any number of things to identify us within a specific group. And this would allow other members of his group to read this man from a distance. In the plains, that's going to be important because you can see someone coming from miles away. So bright clothing or large status symbols is going to be, are going to be particularly important. As I look out, I want to know from a mile or two or further away, whether you are a friend or enemy, are you a merchant traveling? Are you a spy? Are you, you know, what is your purpose coming into my land? And so clothing becomes a, an important symbol of that because it can be seen from a distance. I might see the color. I might see something like the use of feathers or furs and go, okay, that's someone of a certain class or that's someone with a specific purpose. Now, shield painting was also common and derived primarily from religious visions. Now, we're not seeing that here in the watercolor, but these shield paintings would have had magical powers or protections granted to the warrior, the belief being that I had this dream involving this uh, item or animal or thing. I painted on my shield and it will somehow protect me. And you might say, well, that just seems kind of different. But it's not because we see the same sort of tradition going back to Constantine, who has a dream that God appears to him and gives him a symbol to put on his shields. And when he paints that on all his troop shields, they go into battle and they win. Uh, we see the same thing in the medieval with images of crosses on crusader shields, for example, or images of family crests or images of any number of other things. So we see the same thing, same concept in the West as we do here with the shield painting. 